Algebraic Reasoning, Chapter 2.3, Exercise 1 through 11. This set or section has to do with transformations of cubic functions. And if you were around to look at Section 2.2, a little bit earlier video, we looked at the transformation of quadratic functions. Well, for this one, the book also uses a standard form, which I'm going to write here. Standard form for this is going to be f of x equals a times quantity bx minus c. And this time, instead of squared, it's going to be cubed plus d. And so these constants a, b, c, and d cause the graph of the cubic function to do different things versus the parent function x, f of x equals x cubed. So I'm going to go over about half these problems. I think I'll do the odd number problems, maybe with the exception of number 11. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and I might get 11 started on this. So here we have h of x equals 2x minus 1, or quantity 2x minus 1 cubed. And so what do these different things cause the function to do versus f of x equals x cubed? Well, first of all, if you look at x cubed, now I'm not going to go ahead and expand the whole thing. But our first term here, when we expand, is going to be 2x cubed. So you're going to have 8x cubed. So this value of 2 will cause the graph of the cubic parent function, fx equals x cubed, to be vertically stretched by a factor of 3. So 2 cubed equals 8 means a vertical stretch by a factor of Eight. So be it's just like multiplying the coordinates times eight. So it'll be a steeper curve than the regular parent function of f of x equals x cubed. Next, this minus one. Well, if you've studied transformations of functions you'll know that this minus 1 is going to counterintuitively switch or move this function one unit not to the left but to the right because if you look at the parent function here this bx minus c well anyway we have to kind of look at this differently since we have 2x minus 1 inside the parentheses so to figure out where this thing crosses the x-axis, we need to go ahead and take what's inside the parentheses here, 2x minus 1, and set that equal to 0. And when we solve for x, we will have the dislocation, the horizontal dislocation, of this cubic function. So now solving for x, we add 1 to both sides of the equation. So we get 2x is equal to 1 dividing by 2, x equals 1 half. And so this means that the function, I'll say the graph of the function is translated And 
that's going to be one half unit. to the right. And you can you can graph this with a graphing calculator and see that that is in fact the case. So you'll see a steeper curve shifted one half unit to the right. So just looking at what the what the transform function would look like. The regular cubic parent function is like this, kind of, kind of like this. And what you're going to do is you're going to shift one half unit to the right. I'm just marking on one half unit and make the thing a lot skinnier. So the thing's going to look something like this. And if you doubt me, you can graph that in the calculator. And see what that looks like. So I'm just going to box these in as correct portions of answers. So vertical stretch and translation one unit to the right. Next on our problem we'll look at is three. We have two times quantity x plus 2 cubed. What you're going to have here is this one here, 2. This means vertical stretch by a factor of uh, two, okay? So it'll make the cubic, graph cubic function steeper. Now, as far as what this x plus two does, well, if you remember, I think it was, it was uh, a out here, bx minus c cubed, plus D. And so what we're going to do is we're going to shift what you have is since it's positive 2, you have to have X minus negative 2. So shifts or translates two units again counterintuitively to the x plus moves to the left. And so I wrote shifts here instead of translates. And that's going to be really all of the transformation versus the original parent function. So uh, I have these two items here. To me, without a when you just have x plus or minus something, it makes it easier than it was, for instance, in problem one, where you had a, a 2x minus 1. Next on our problem 5, all right, we have some complications here, but let's take a look at them. This negative sign, what does a negative sign do? What it does is it reflects, reflects graph about the x-axis. So what that means is that you have a you have a regular graph like this. A normal graph would look something like this. Or reflected about the x-axis would look would look more like this. Yeah. I'm drawing in red now. 
that would be the what the reflection would look like. Just kind of turned about the x-axis. All right. Next, we're going to have this free force right here. And it's a lesson one. So we have three force vertically compresses. Now, one and three, we had vertically stretch, right? By a factor. of three-fourths. So that's going to, instead of making stretching vertically, it's going to compress it to make a, a wider type of, not as steep, a cubic function. This negative six, so that will be a shift, that negative six, let me just write out what that negative six is. So six shifts graph uh, six units to the right. And finally, we have this plus three right here we have a lot of things going on here so three shifts or translates the graph up three units okay so we have a lot of things going on here could find the y-intercept from here if we expand it out. So at least four items. Quite a bit. Okay, next on the problem, which is seven. Okay, we have this I'm going to, there's sort of a combination stretch in between this one fourth inside the parentheses and this negative three outside. We're going to have very similar in the respect of negative sign. What does it do? Reflex graph about x axis. Okay, this three, let's see if we piece them out here. Three vertically stretches by a factor of three. Now this one fourth is in here. That's going to be a horizontal, in effect, that's going to, in effect, horizontally stretch. Because when you, especially when you take the cube of that, you'll have one fourth times one fourth, which is one sixteenth, times another one fourth, which is one sixty fourth. So that'll be a horizontal stretch.
by a factor of one fourth. But really, when you take that one fourth cubed, it'll really flatten out that the graph of that function, which is going to be partially offset by this factor of three on the outside. This minus one. Minus one shifts graph. Now, how many? Well, if you take one fourth x minus one equals zero and you solve for, for x, so you have one fourth x equals one and you multiply both sides of this equation by four. We have x is equal to 4. So negative 1 shifts graph 4 units to the right. right. And finally, this 5 shifts. Five shifts graph five units up. So here we have five changes going on here. I'll just put it here one more stretch by a factor of one fourth. Vertically stretches by a factor of three. Finally, a negative sign reflects graph about the x-axis. So a lot of things going on here. Okay, next. We'll go to, to nine. For questions nine through eleven, identify the key attributes, including the domain range, the x-intercepts, and y-intercepts of the cubic function described by the equation in the graph, write the domain and ranges in inequalities, and in set builder notation. Again, not I'm not really a particularly great fan of set builder notation, but in inequality notation, our domain is going to be x is all real numbers. So greater than negative infinity, less than infinity range. The inequality notation is going to be all real numbers also, but we have y is greater than negative infinity but less than infinity. In interval notation, which they're not asking for, the domain is going to be all real numbers, which is negative infinity, common infinity. And the range is going to be the same, negative infinity, comma, infinity. That's our range. In set builder notation, we have we have x such that x is an element of all real numbers. So that would be our domain. Domain here. Our range will be the same except for y instead of x. So y such that y is an element of all real numbers. Set the notation. Next, uh, x intercepts, y intercepts. Well, x intercept looks like it's between 0 and 1, but we're going to get that exactly. And to get that exactly, we're going to take 3x um, plus 1 and set that equal to 0, subtract 2, subtract 2. So we get 3x equals negative 2. And dividing by 3, we get x 
equals negative two-thirds. So for that, our x-intercept, which I'm abbreviating, is the coordinate pair negative two over three, comma zero. Okay? And our y-intercept looks like it's going to be eight or nine or something like that. Well, graphically, what we can do is when we expand this out to the third term, this last one, uh, we know our first term is going to be, I'm just going to write over here, f of x. When we expand this out, we're going to have 3x cubed, some things in between. And the last one, we're going to have 2 cubed. And so that's going to give us our first term of 27 x cubed. And then our last term, after all these others, is going to be plus 8. Okay, plus 8. So our y-intercept is going to be the coordinate pair 0, comma 8. So that's going to be, I think, all of our things we're looking for. I'm just going to box all this in. Be boxed. Inclusive x-intercept, y-intercept, right here. Okay, and really, I just want to give a little direction on number 11, the last one in this set. It'll be similar to number 9 as far as finding where the y-intercept is. If we take this, this negative 1 fourth x plus 2 and set that equal to 0, we will find the x-intercept. Our y-intercept is going to be found by taking this 2 cubed, multiplying that by 2. So 2 cubed is 8. Multiply by 2 is 16 minus 3. So 16 minus 3, so our y-intercept is going to be 16 minus 3 or 13. So some hints. Again, domain and range, each of them, all real numbers. Well, that's all I'm going to do on this video lesson. Good luck, and thanks for viewing.